You are in the Mentoring Club Hour, sponsored by Silicon Valley Startups on Clubhouse. And Silicon Valley Startups here is organized by one of our mentors, Sean Flynn. He invited us to do these sessions at the early, early stage of experimenting on Clubhouse. So the Mentoring Club is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide a mentoring community for aspiring and seasoned leaders. Anywhere in the world, we help working people find mentors who can guide them to develop the skills they need to achieve their career and life goals. We help mentees fulfill their goals through meaningful work that creates positive impact in the world. And as mentees become leaders, our dream is for them to become mentors to others. So you are currently in the room we created as a series called Career and Life Journeys of Mentors. And this afternoon, we are featuring one of our mentors, Brian Balch. The theme of his journey is about a life with purpose. So I will hand over the floor to Hong uh, as our interviewer and welcome Hong and Brian. Thank you. Thanks, Liso. Thanks for the uh, for opening this room. I'm honored to welcome a mentor of the Mentoring Club, Brian Bolch. And Brian has had a very full and diverse eclectic career running preschool and daycare centers, selling insurance, running a, a public storage facilities, promoted to district manager, and on and on. He has been board member and then executive director. A very full and diverse career, so he has traveled many, many different paths. So for that matter, we can learn quite a bit about how Brian has aligned his career to his true self. My first question is the following. Is there a theme or a set of themes that jump out in your career looking back? First, Hong, I want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to participate in your new Clubhouse Ventures, and uh, it's an honor to be a part of it. And in answer to your question, as I did look back over my career, and as you mentioned, it's been an eclectic career. I've dabbled in lots of different industries, and I would say that there are basically three themes that have kind of been woven through each one of my different types of positions. And first one is, is that I like being in a position to make decisions. And to do that, I kind of embrace accountability. A lot of times people want to make decisions, but they don't want to be responsible or accountable. But I've always enjoyed being accountable and having the ability to make decisions. Another theme is that throughout my career, I've been either in a supervisory role, a managing role, or a leadership role. And finally, the biggest one and foremost one is being able to help people. That includes either the clients that I've served or the staff that I've worked with. And all of it comes to the, the purpose what I believe we all should have in life, and that is to be of service to others. A number mm -hmm. of themes jumped out for you. Looking back mm -hmm. at your career, when did they start coming up? The reality of it is, is I believe it did start from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. However, I didn't necessarily realize it when it was first happening, or was that my intention? Mm -hmm. But I think in looking back, I can see where all of these things these different themes have been woven into the decision-making and over time they just became more and more apparent and they allowed me to discover that the purpose in life is to be of service to others. And by having that, that allowed me to use that purpose in my decision-making process as I've developed in my career and still to this day when I'm making decisions. As Steve Jobs famously shared, you can only connect the dot looking back. You can look right. connect the dot forward. Accountability, leadership, they are stable. They are your path. And yet, among all those, helping others and being of service is the big theme. Am I correct? Yes. Helping others is my primary theme. I believe that all of us in our careers, we have to figure out, one, what we value in life and what we really want out of life. Because once we know those things, then we can make our decisions. And what happens oftentimes is that we'll find ourselves in a storm or an unexpected situation. And if we don't already know what our values are and what it is that we're striving to do, we really don't have a compass. And so then we just kind of go whichever way the storm 
blows is and where the most pressure and influence comes from. But if you have that theme and purpose and desires in life, if you already know that, then you can use that as your compass to get you through those troubling times and the unexpected events that happen to all of us in life. I had talked with you previously, and and you said that early on in your career, what you were doing was chasing the money, what you call chasing the money, and then was successful. I didn't make a ton, Mm -hmm. especially in sales, and then found out that was not really your calling. Finding out that being of service is more important to you and, and embracing that path, how did that make a difference? It was truly a game changer for me because... Early on in life when I was chasing money and looking for the next promotion, moving from one job to another just for the increase in salary, the next perk, whether it's a company car or whatever, making those changes. Once I moved from what others could do for me to focusing on what I could do to help them, it totally changed my life. I've heard the saying before that giving starts the receiving process and that that's truly what's happened for me. Once I started to be able to focus on what I could do to help others, whether that was clients or the communities that I was serving or my staff, the more I gave of myself and and time, et cetera, the more offers I began to receive. I, I no longer had to really chase or really even apply for things. I actually got to the point where more things were offered to me and people were asking for stuff. You know, I got more speaking engagements. I got more consulting requests. I got more job offers and opportunities that even got me into the role of being a mentor with the mentoring club. Can you expand a little bit more on that as well? So first of all, that others appreciate you, right? The fact that you mm-hmm. are more aligned with your values. Sure. Others came to appreciate you more and you're, you're sought after, your reputation is built. Anything else, for example, internally, how you feel more at peace or less rush, or less doubt in terms of are you doing what you truly want? What are the differences that that make for you? It definitely builds self-confidence because that way when decisions have to be made and whether, you know, it becomes a situation of being ethical Mm -hmm. or knowing what the right thing to do and taking, well, I need the job because it's what pays me the money. I'm able to just make the decision because I know that more good things are going to come down the road. For example, when I was working for a national company doing consulting around the the United States, over a year's time, I spent traveling over 200,000 miles in the air in in a 12-month period and worked with 30 different companies in 18 different industries and worked with companies such as a peanut farmer in Georgia to a cabinet maker in Spokane, Washington, down to countertop company in Wisconsin to construction company in Texas and oil field services also in Texas. So I've worked with all kinds of consulting companies, but towards the end of the first year, which and I really loved the work and I even enjoyed the travel, but I felt like the company was starting to get me to do or wanted me to do unethical things such as convince businesses to spend money that I didn't think one that they could afford to spend or two that they needed to spend. Then it just got to the point where I said, you know, I'm not going to be able to look myself in the mirror in the morning if I know that I'm trying to get these people to spend money for my benefit and not their benefit. So I just had to step away from that job. I stepped away not knowing when my next job was going to come. I just knew I would have to do more consulting at the local level. That confidence that you are doing right by yourself is quite important. Can you speak to that, uh, comment on that? I think that's a challenge that everybody is encountering more and more. It does create clouded judgment at times. I'll give you another example. I was an executive director for a a nonprofit organization in uh, Contra Costa County. When I took the job, I was told that the organization that I was serving was the purpose and mission of it was to improve the quality of life for people living in that community and that I was basically the conduit between the city and the community. And so part of my role was to attend city council meetings and such to make sure that whatever the council was deciding that the community understood. In my working with that community, part of the job was hearing what their issues were and then taking it to the city council. And when I would do that, my board members would tell me, the city doesn't want to hear what they have to say. They just want you to tell them what the city wants done, not Hmm what their issues are. And I said, but my job is, is I'm working to help better their lives. This company or this organization is just a vehicle 
for me to help this community. I'm committed to helping this community. If this vehicle is not going to allow me to do that, then I'll just pull over to the curb and get out of this vehicle and find another vehicle to help this community because I work for the community. The organization signed my checks, but I work for the community. Hmm. And since they didn't want to do that, I left that organization. And then I just continued my own consulting business, working directly with the business owners, the community at large, without that organization. That clarity and courage that comes from your conviction, there is that ethic, that expectation and ethic about serving whose interests are you serving is, is, is really important. Very much so. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Now, in terms of uh, the, that path, can somebody learn from you and not duplicate, but be inspired to find true north and their path? I don't know necessarily that it was someone that just laid out a path for me and told me, you know, hey, this is the way to do it. I think it just came from my upbringing, being raised by parents that had great influence over me. And they were always, both my mother and father were always in the habit of working and helping others less fortunate than we were. You know, my dad always tried to teach me, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing things so that you can look yourself in the mirror. I've heard that story or that message hundreds and hundreds of times that, you know, whatever you do, you need to be able to look yourself in the mirror and be able to look people in the eye. And it's kind of like, you know, if you're always telling them the truth, then you don't ever have to worry about what you said before because you don't have to remember lies. And so if you're being truthful and honest, and the biggest thing that he taught me was that everything in life evolves around your relationships with other people and nothing builds relationships faster than trust and rapport. And so they have to know that you care about them before they even care about what you know. And so I've always tried to put my caring for them first and foremost, so that then they would trust and believe in what I, I was saying to them. I worked with ex-offenders that had substance abuse issues. And one of the things that the Department of Corrections asked me when we were starting the program is they say, how are you gonna be able to connect with these substance abusers if you've never had a substance abuse issue? And I said, well, I don't have to walk in their shoes to be able to sh show that I care about them. And so I think once they realize that whatever I'm telling them is because I care about them, then they'll be more inclined to listen to me. Then I went to work with people with disabilities and they said, you don't have a disability. How are you going to be able to get these people to believe in what you're telling them? And again, I told them the same thing. Once they see that I care about them as people, then they'll care about what I know. And so then I went to work with minority populations that most of them didn't speak English. And again, it came back to the same thing. People really don't care what you know until that they know you care. And if they know you care, then they'll pay attention to what you know. And so I'm a firm believer that you have to start with showing compassion and empathy and try to understand the people. And you always have to start with where they're at. And once they know that you care about them and know where they're at, then you can help get them to where they want to go. It's Warren Buffett that famously said the first thing is in terms of recruiting either a partner or, or an employee or somebody to work with. He said, first thing is this person outstandingly intelligent. He did say that, but, uh, mm -hmm. but much more important, he added right away is integrity, right? Mm -hmm. If the person is intelligent and doesn't have integrity, then you're in a, a deeper hole than you started. And he said, you can lose money. That's never a good thing. But if you lose your reputation, that is a showstopper right away. That's Absolutely. very true. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Is there an advice you would give to your younger self uh, starting out in life? If I was starting out, I would tell myself and I would tell young people, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. So many people spend all their efforts and time working on their job and their supervisor or employer for the most part is just training them to just do the task at hand but you need to take time to invest in yourself so that you're continuously learning and growing and learning new things because at some point you could be doing the best job in the world and that business could go out of business they could go bankrupt it would have nothing to do with you and you could become unemployed, but if you're constantly working and improving yourself and learning new skills and staying apprised of your industry and what's going on in the industry that you've chosen to be in, then you'll always be able to find jobs. You'll always build rapport with other 
uh, leaders in other companies, even your competitors. So just being involved in your industry and continuously growing and building your own reputation as a person is more important than how good you do your individual job. So I would always say work harder on yourself than you do on your job. That also includes, you know, handling your emotions. Most people let their emotions control them instead of them controlling their emotions. And the ones that are the most successful are the ones that can control their emotions because we're all going to run into obstacles. We're all going to run into turbulent times. We're going to run into unexpected events that are going to upset our path. We all have potholes in our paths that we're traveling, and it's how we handle that that keeps us moving forward or moves us in a better direction. And that's by controlling our emotions. When we get all flustered and upset, then our emotions control us. So part of that working harder on yourself is working on things such as controlling your emotions instead of letting your emotions control you. In terms of controlling my emotions, there is controlling and there's suppressing. I can control myself in terms of suppressing anger or whatever. I can do that uh, Mm -hmm. since I was very young. But that's not the same thing. Nowadays, I can learn to read my emotions, that it's there without suppressing, and yet not act on it, not right away, not suppression, but control Mm -hmm. in terms of suspension of action until I I find better clarity uh, as to what to do. Controlling emotion is understanding what we get frustrated over. I was just working with a leadership team uh, a couple of days ago. They were frustrated with an owner and how he was spending money. They were saying they needed additional vehicles and they needed to have better maintenance on their equipment. And they thought the owner was spending money frivolously on things that didn't have anything to do with their work. And I tried to tell them, you know, hey, don't focus on what the owner is doing because you cannot control what the owner does. He owns a Mm -hmm. business. It's his priority to do whatever he wants. His job is just to make sure the business stays in operation and how he spends the surplus money. That's up to him. What you can focus on is what can you do to improve the situation, whether it's your tuning up equipment, whether you're making sure it gets oiled properly, whether it's getting serviced regularly. You can do those things. Focus on what you can control And don't spend all of your time and energy being frustrated over stuff that you can't control. I've been doing personal development and coaching people for, gosh, almost 18 years now. People always ask me, how many people have you changed over the 18 years that you coached them? And I said, the only person I've ever changed is me because we can't change anyone else. We can give them tools. We can give them perspectives, but they have to make the change. And so we can't make an owner change how he spends his money. All we can do is focus on what we can do to change and make it better for the employees that are still working there. Whether it's somebody you supervise or a coworker, you want to say, how can I make the situation better and not focus on what you can't control? Because all that does is frustrate you and upset you. And then it makes everyone else around you feel that negativity. So it's better to focus on what you can accomplish and achieve than what you can't. A big part of what you just said, which is, to help that person move on and improve and make leaps and bounds in their purpose uh, as opposed to Mm -hmm. your purpose for them. Can you comment on that? That's actually the advice that I would give to anybody that was just starting a career or, or starting their life is I would tell them to focus on growth opportunities. And by that, I mean, you take a job and you learn as much as you can, and then you're hoping that you're going to get promoted or advance and maybe you can and maybe you can't, but even if you can't promote so only so far you can go, maybe go to a family owned business and everybody in the upper positions are part of the family and you're not in the bloodline. So you're never going to be one of those people. So you're still going to learn some skills while you're there. Then you take those skills and you go to another job and work somewhere else. I just worked recently worked with a a gentleman that, that one day wants to own his own mechanic shop. He wants to work on cars and own his own business, but he doesn't know how to run a business and He really doesn't know much about cars, but he had he had an opportunity to to get a job at a local Jiffy Loop. You should do that. I said, one, you're going to learn some of the basic stuff. Granted, they don't do tune-ups and those things, but they change oil. They look at radiators. They check brake fluid. They do tire rotation. So you're going to get some skills there, and you're also going to see how they take payments and 
how they keep track of the cars and are able to tell the customers, hey, you know, it's been this many miles since you've had a, your filters changed. You want to change the filters. And so you can learn those things. And once you get that, then you can go and get a job at a mechanic shop because now you have some experience. You can say, hey, I know how to rotate tires. Hey, I know how to change oil. Hey, I can change the transmission fluid. But I really want to get a job where I can learn how to do tune-ups and replace cylinders or uh, spark plugs. And so now you've got your foot in the door, so you're continuously learning. And then eventually you'll learn enough skills that then you can start your own business. But it all starts with focusing on growth. It's not always about the money. It's can I learn the most and how can I advance the most? Organizations that I lead, including the one I'm at now, I tell them when they start, this is the position I'm hiring you for. I know it's not a career position. It's not going to be enough to pay you for a career position. But what I really want to do is I want to teach you as much as I can. And hopefully that you're going to be able to stick with me for two years because you're learning so much and everything I teach you, you'll be able to add another line to your resume. And at the end of two years, I can maybe help you promote and get to where you want to go. And when you leave, you'll be able to say, hey, I didn't make a lot of money when I worked there, but I sure learned a lot. And so sometimes the people will stay because they're learning and sometimes they won't. But the key thing is, is that if you know it's not going to be a position where they're going to be able to get to where they're making 70, 80, 90,000 a year, and you know it's only going to be an 18 to $20 an hour job, the goal is to teach them as much as they can so they feel like they're learning so that they do have growth opportunities. If it's not with you, it's somewhere else, and you can be grateful that they work for you that, for that period of time, and it becomes a win-win for you and them. The path of growth clearly entails doubt about their capabilities because you're growing into something you don't know, right? So mm -hmm. there are doubts and challenges. Can you comment on that? As far as the doubt and the challenge goes, I try to use people that have been where they were at, maybe somebody that's been had more training and so that they can use them as a role model to say, hey, look, they started exactly where you were at. And I try to mm -hmm. tell everybody, no matter what job they're in, that, hey, every winner started as a beginner. Nobody is good at anything when they first start. And that's why we have to learn to embrace failure except that failure is part of the success process. I don't know who it was that said it, but someone said, if you want to be more successful, learn to fail faster because we learn a lot from our failures. I think it was Tom Watson with IBM who one time had a vice president made a $10 million mistake. And when right. the vice president came in to give him his letter of resignation, he said, are you kidding me? I just spent $10 million educating you. I'm not going to let you go now because I know you won't make that mistake again. And we all have to look at our mistakes as learning processes to let the people know that everywhere I work, I encourage mistakes. I'm consulting with a landscaping company, and the, and the guy trimmed back a tree that really upset the owners because they were using it as a privacy in front of the front window, and it got trimmed back so people could see in the front window. And it was a fig tree, and it still had figs on the branches, and they threw the branches away. So the owners were upset. Employee began to doubt himself about making decisions. And I said, look, you've been doing this business for 15 years. I said, don't let that one mistake define you. Let that mm. go. As a matter of fact, I'm hoping you're going to make more mistakes because that means that you're trying and learning and growing. Because if you never make another mistake, that means you're not going to ever do anything more than what you're already doing. So don't worry about the mistakes. We're going to have more mistakes. I want you to have more mistakes. We're going to learn from them and just keep growing. Everyone has to learn to embrace mistakes and failure as part of the process. You're pointing out also the, the fact that there are resources around these people. I mean, clearly they are with you and that's what you see. And you're pointing to resources. Now, let's say if somebody is not so lucky necessarily, what would your advice be? We don't want to just jump out and make huge mistakes, but we always want to be challenging and growing a little bit. And one of the ways to do that is every day at the end of each day, we should be reflecting on what we've done, whether it was a success or just maintaining, say, well, well, we maintained today, but what could I have done today that could have progressed us further? Or, hey, today I tried to progress us further and I stubbed my toe. Mm -hmm. It wasn't earth shattering, but I stubbed my toe. What can I learn from this so I don't do this tomorrow? And what can I learn from this so that maybe tomorrow I can get past that obstacle instead of stubbing my toe on it again? So a lot of learning and stuff just comes from reflection on what the results we are getting. And if they're what we're getting, what do we got to do to get more of them? And if it's not what we're getting, what do we got to do different to get different results? 
Regarding reflection, there are a couple of practices. Some of those at the end of the day, some of them are at the beginning of the day, things like journaling, things like writing up about gratitude. What are you feel gratitude about today or something or mm -hmm. the intention for today as you start the day? Do you practice any of those things? Oh, I practice them, a lot of them. And some of the things that I, I do is every day I, I start off by saying, who can I benefit today? What can I improve on today? Mm. And sometimes it's something I can improve on myself. Sometimes it's something I can improve at the office. Sometimes it's something I can do to help somebody else improve. Maybe it's updating a procedure, but I'm always thinking, what can I do to benefit somebody? And what can I do to improve? And then at the end of the day, I'm saying, who benefited from me today? What can I do so that I'll be better tomorrow? If you were to write a book about your life journey so far, what would the title of that book be? I've written a couple of books. The first one was How to Create Value First, and that was on 10 or 15 years of working with nonprofits. And each chapter is a different real-life lesson and what I learned from it and the takeaways from it and action steps people can take to learn from that lesson. But if I was going to write a book today, and I am actually planning on writing this book, mm. the title of the book will be All Business is People Business. Because as I've traveled the country, worked in different industries, it didn't matter what the problem was, whether it was a revenue problem, an operation problem, a personnel problem, a turnover problem, working too many hour problem. Every problem was created by people and every problem was resolved by people. No matter what the industry is, all business comes down to people business. When you can improve the quality of your relationships with your people and help mm. them grow, your business will grow and the quality of your life will improve. Thanks so much, Brian, for sharing with us today. Very inspiring. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to invite Liesl to reset the room so we can open up for anybody else to chime in, maybe share their perspective and experience, and maybe ask further questions. Let's open up the room. Liesl, back to you. Thank you. It, it was a very refreshing and, as Hong said, inspirational conversation between the two of you. So at this point, just to refresh the room, I would just like to mention again that this club, Silicon Valley Startups, is a partnership with uh, one of our mentors, Sean Flynn, and he set this up early on in partnership with other collaborators in different startup industries. For this series, we created what we call the career and life journeys of mentors, primarily to have an understanding of who our mentors are internally within the community. We will publish the recording of the interview on YouTube and eventually a podcast channel. And now that Clubhouse has the replays functionality, we'll see how that goes. And so we have a few ways of doing the recording. So thank you again for being willing to give this interview, Brian. And I will go ahead and send the floor over to Hong again for some questions from Carol and Naj. Thanks, Liso. Yeah, we have a, a small room today, so it's more intimate and we can chime in more. Welcome, Carol. Th Carol, thanks for joining us today. Carol is another mentor of the Mentoring Club. Her career started very early on and very successfully, and she has mentored literally thousands of people at all stages of life. And now that she has retired, her mentoring still continues. Welcome, Carol. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I would like to invite you to share with us. I totally have a resounding agreement with Brian in that Caring about your people is the most important thing to do. I know that in the 2000s, 2010s, companies were having trouble retaining their employees. There were surveys and surveys done and what kind of environment keeps people working for our company? And the number one answer was that they're cared about, that the company they work for cares about them. I think, Brian, you're right on track. Keep teaching it, especially to leaders, because that is the biggest and best thing anybody can do is to give of themselves so that others can grow and guide them in a way that is in their best interest. And it will always come back to pay you back. I saw that in my career, just like you did, Brian, over mm -hmm. and over and over again. When you care about people, they work hard for you. You meet all your objectives, you meet all your budgets, you 
achieve all your goals and company requirements. So it's a very valuable lesson that I hope lots of people get to hear from you, Brian, because that is the secret to success. Thanks, Carol, for bringing that up. Uh, On that note, definitely, I I think some of us here have heard many times over now the current great resignation uh, that's going on where not only companies are losing employees, but also they are having a very hard time filling the vacancies. That issue is coming back now, I think, with a vengeance. Can you comment further about what you think companies should do uh, at this stage in terms of finding uh, talents for for their openings? Getting the people in the door is the biggest challenge. I think the organization I'm leading right now, we're, we're struggling to get people to come in the door. Prior to people not coming in the door, when the pandemic first hit, I had two part-time employees that were very knowledgeable and skilled in the industry that I really wanted to have work for me full-time, but they only worked at night because they had full-time jobs during the day. Just out of sheer luck, both of them worked at different jobs where someone had tested positive for COVID. And since they were in the vicinity of the person, they had to stay home for 10 days to make sure that they didn't have any symptoms themselves. On the 10th day, they said, hey, we can't go back to work today, but they told us we can go to work next Monday, and it was a Friday. And they said, can we come to your staff meeting? Because every Friday, I conduct a staff meeting from 9 to 12, and most of it is just spent on leadership. I really don't talk much about the the day-to-day operations because I leave that up to the supervisors to meet with the people to talk about that individually. So it's more about mindset and personal development and growth. And so they wanted to come to my staff meeting because they'd never been to a staff meeting. And so I said, sure, just wear your mask and you'll be okay. So they showed up and after the training, they go, wow, this is the type of organization I want to work for. Can we come and work for you? And both of them left their full-time jobs to come work for me full-time. And now they're both my two leading supervisors for my organization that started just because I was pouring knowledge and stuff into them that was going to help them as parents, help them in their career paths that really wasn't necessarily on our business, but it was more about helping them grow as people and as leaders. I'm always showing videos and stuff that don't pertain to the work, but it literally pertains to their mindset as an individual and a leader. And when other businesses are shutting down and spending less money and cutting back, one of the first things they do is cut back on training. And I've Mm. continued to increase our training because it lets the people that work for us tell other people, hey, come work here. They're going to develop you and train you. And so I do actually have four interviews lined up next week Mm -hmm. to hire potential people. And before this past week, I couldn't get anybody to even apply for a job. But now just because I've told the employees that we need to expand and grow, that uh, I got people lined up and it's strictly because of the way they feel like they're being treated on the job. You put your finger on the, the number one source of good hire, which is employee referral. Mm Mm-hmm. That is the best quality and the most effective, I think, Yes. that people know. Thanks again for sharing. Nadj, uh, thanks for joining us um, from across the world uh, at the Ungodly Hours. Uh, thanks for joining us once again every week. Uh, yes, please share your experience and any questions you may have. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Hong. Thanks, Lisel. Uh, it's 9, almost 10 here 10 a.m. in the Philippines and thank you so much um, Brian for um, sharing your life and career journey. Lizel uh, had me watch the the YouTube of Mentoring Matters and I really enjoyed the pendulum of life and it's it's a really good reminder. I know working for money and working with a purpose is not always easy so how do you balance it if you need to pay bills because we all do but at the same time your values are being challenged how do you manage it because if it's challenged and it's hard to keep jumping from one company to another thank you Mm -hmm. i think that's part of the philosophy of work harder on yourself than you do on your job one of the first books i ever wrote was actually an ebook on understanding what needs to be understood And basically, it was that everybody needs to have more than one source of income, whether it's writing a book and getting people to 
buy it and over time it just becomes a residual income it's not a steady big stream of money but it's just a little income coming in also maybe a person does arts and crafts you take something that you enjoy doing whether it's uh, sewing and making clothes or painting pictures and then figure out a way to turn that into a retail business whether it's online or at flea markets or you just practice studying stuff so that then you're developing a skill. Maybe you're taking college courses. Maybe you're taking adult school classes at night, or maybe you're taking a wood shop class so you can learn how to be a construction worker, but do something away from your work hours to create another source of income or prepare you for another opportunity. We all have to, especially when we're first starting out, we have to do some type of work, whether we like it or not just so that we do have the money to pay the bills. But that doesn't mean we should settle for that and stay there. We should always be striving to get to a point where we can have more choices. And the choices come from working hard on yourself. Thank you. Actually, I, I can resonate with that because I was sharing with Lucille that I'm in, in this um, position of finding more streams, possible streams for me and my husband. We've been selling insurance for almost a decade. And uh -huh. there was this one instance that we had to really make that big decision in 2017. We were trying to close a big high net worth client. And you know, there's this, we were in that middle, what I just asked you, and we just decided on maintaining our integrity in that kind of transaction and from there on we also discovered explored our talents so yes it's, it's just so hard <laughs> yes <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing i mean everybody works different hours but they always talk about the nine to five job which is basically a, an eight hour day job monday through friday i always tell people Earn a living from nine to five, but create a life from five to nine. And then people say, well, is that in the morning or is that in the evening? And the answer is yes, both <laughs> in the morning and in the evening. So work on developing your life between five and nine, earn a living between nine and five. Yeah, I tend to remind myself and feel gratitude about it. It's no matter how hard things are, that there are opportunities to work hard and get something out of it is actually a privilege of our times. There were times when those opportunities didn't even exist and that may come around again. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. One, we got to be grateful just because we have the ability. Two is we have the initiative to do whatever it takes. I remember as a teenager, I mowed lawns, I delivered newspapers, I even went door to door washing cars. I grew up in the, in the Mojave Desert where it was very, very hot in the summertime and people's driveways were made out of black asphalt and there would be cracks and stuff in them. And so I would literally buy five gallon buckets of asphalt at Home Depots and hardware stores and go door to door and offer to pull the weeds out of the cracks and repave the cracks. So if you have initiative and desire to work, I believe that a person can always find something to do that they can at least pay the bills with. Well, one of the conversations we had with Brian, he mentioned something about an incident early on in your life. I don't know if you were 15 years old, you shared with us the shortest job that you have held. <laughs> Can you tell us? Because that's a fun way to end because you, <laughs> you also have a lesson there. Can you tell us more about that? Other than delivering newspapers and washing cars, but the first time I really worked for a business, I got a job at a restaurant washing dishes. And I lasted two days on the job. One day it took me to realize I didn't want to wash dishes and it took me the second day to quit. So that was the shortest job I ever had was two days washing dishes because I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do in life. Was it your dad who said, move up or? Sure, one, one of the pieces of advice he gave me is that when I was starting out young, he said, you know, you always want to look for growth opportunities. And he said, whenever you go to a job, you want to consider it that in two years time, you're either moving up in the company or you're moving on. And I kind of, took that to heart. So I worked on one job for 13 years and that's because I always had growth opportunities and I had freedom to travel the country and open new offices and hire staff. So I was continuously growing and had the freedom to make decisions. So 
I enjoyed that job for a long time, but most jobs, if, if I saw that I wasn't, there was no future promotional opportunities for me after a year or two, I would move on to something else. I think you've learned a lot of good lessons from your father, and I'm sure there were other uh, role models and mentors in your life as well. We are just quick reminders. Uh, we are having our Mentoring Matters talk this uh, Thursday, and we have Josie Haynes. Um, this is on Eventbrite. Uh, we have Josie Haynes on the third of her series about leadership and be, being an empathetic leader, allyship, um, having to do with inclusion and diversity in the workforce. And now she will talk about women leaders in tech. So um, both men and women are welcome. So please go ahead and share that event with your connections. And we welcome everybody to that session this Thursday uh, at 6.30 Pacific time on Zoom. And every week we have this session on Clubhouse, 5 p.m. Pacific time and also Thursdays. 9 a.m. Pacific time, and we are currently having our career and life journeys of mentors series. And I see that we have Kumaran who just joined us. Please do join us again in our, our succeeding sessions here on Clubhouse. And with that, I'll give the final words to Brian to close the room. Well, thank you, Lizelle. Uh, I, I just want to say thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. I just encourage everyone to realize that mentors are all around you, role models, like-minded collaborators, and coaches everywhere. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. If you just look for people that can help you, they're there. And sometimes there'll be people you know. And I have a lot of mentors and role models that I've never met personally. They don't even know that they're my mentors, but I read their books. I watch their videos, I download their apps, I pay attention to their email posts and their letters that they put out. And so you can learn from anybody if you're just seeking the knowledge. And with that, I just want to thank everybody for taking their time to be on the call tonight and I hope they got some value out of it. Definitely, I did. And hopefully those people in our community, the mentoring club, as well as people who are not yet members who will consume our content on our social media channels and the full interview will be on YouTube eventually. Uh, we will publish it and um, it's really great to get to know more our mentors in depth. Um, I think this is one of the best programs that uh, we have come up with within the mentoring club. So it really is very rewarding and fulfilling to get to know more of our mentors. When people can resonate with your stories or our stories, then that's how we can grow the community um, organically, sharing the same values, as well as looking forward and becoming better leaders ourselves. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night, good morning, or good day. We'll see you again next time. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Hong. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the journey, everyone. Counting down.